Hi, so this is uh, topic 5.2 and it's on innovations. So let's start with the definition. So an innovation is uh, the business of putting it, well, it's basically an invention that makes money. <laughs> so it's the, the business of putting an invention into the marketplace and making it a success. And that's, that's what is required for an innovation. You need an invention, which is a new idea, and you need it to be a, a success in the marketplace. If you don't have those two things, then it is not an innovation. It can be an invention, but not an innovation. So um, invent, uh, innovations are inventions that are, are a commercial success, as I said earlier. In other words, you must make money from the invention in order for it to be considered an innovation. This is kind of an interesting innovation. Um, so you know, back in the day, um, there was this idea that you are what you eat. And so for a long time, people really tried to avoid fatty foods because, you know, if you are what you eat, you eat fat, then you'll become overweight. So one of the things that, that um, this company, Lay's, decided to do was they decided to try to get um, something kind of like artificial sugar. So artificial sugar, your body can't digest it. You know, this is, I'm talking about like stevia or aspartamine or there's, there's quite a few of them um, that, that your body can't digest. So they tried to do that with oil, so for potato chips. And so they invented this stuff called Olestra, which was an oil which your body can't digest. And so essentially it would just pass right through you. So that was a problem because people, you know, we're eating these things, and one of the side effects of it was sort of a an oily, runny stool. So essentially, it made you have kind of an oil, oily, runny um, diarrhea. So it uh, it didn't work out well. So it it was an uh, an invention, uh, you know, an interesting invention. And if they had gotten it right, you know, maybe you know it would have been a huge success. Uh, but it wasn't a success in the marketplace, so it wasn't an innovation. So this is the opposite of an innovation. This is an invention that didn't work because it wasn't uh, it wasn't a success in the marketplace. Uh, here's another example. So, and what we're going to be talking about is why do most inventions fail to become innovations? So. Few inventions become successful uh, due to the following reasons, and one of them is marketability. So, if you can't market your product, nobody is, you know, it cannot be an innovation because it doesn't satisfy that success in the marketplace, um, and basically it doesn't make money. So, here's another example this is the Ford Etzel, and it was meant to be like the futuristic car, it was made back in the late 50s late 1950s and it was it was meant to be futuristic it was meant to be uh, you know more or less low cost but when they re released it people thought it was ugly they didn't um, they thought it was too expensive and you know sort of the the fashions for cars had moved on and so people didn't want this car and so it failed and therefore it was not a, a marketable product and therefore not an innovation it was a an invention with no market. Okay, and another reason that inventions fail um, to become innovations is financial support. So sometimes you need a lot of financial support to get an idea up and running and onto the market. And if you can't find that financial support, then you know you may not be able to market your product, and therefore it can't be an innovation. Okay, um, here's some. Uh, interesting links to this this is a and please have a look at these these are failed Kickstarter projects um, Kickstarter is a website where you can market your innovation or your invention and try to get it to be you know something that, that people buy uh, but there are many many failed Kickstarter projects so please do have a look at this link and uh, it'll give you some idea of, of ones that just didn't get the financial support that they needed Okay, marketing. So if you are, if you have something that is not marketed correctly or to the right target markets, then it can basically not turn into an innovation. And this is an example. You probably have never heard of it. It's called the Zune. And basically, it was back in the day when when iPods first came out. This was sort of Microsoft's answer to the iPod, um, but people didn't want it, right? Uh, Apple does an amazing marketing job. They always have, and um, hopefully, well, probably always will. Uh, but you know, it this just did not catch on with people. So people said, "Well, you know, it doesn't look like something I want. Let's stick with an, an Apple iPod."
So they failed in that marketing race. And therefore, the Zune is an invention that didn't become an innovation. Price, uh, as we talked about with the Etzel, uh, if people think that the, the price is um, too much, too expensive to purchase, then they're simply not going to purchase it. So you need to have it affordable, cost-effective, and value for money. Um, and if it's too expensive to purchase or the manufacturer and consumer may not see it worth its cost, compared to its use. Keep in mind a product's price needs to be uh, equivalent to the income of a specific age group that would buy the majority of the product. So this is something that is interesting. It, it goes to uh, marketing also, but you need to do your research. If you're trying to sell something um, that is expensive to, let's say, tweens, you're probably not going to do well, right? They don't, they, they have quite a bit of money, but they don't have like, you know, uh, 45 to 60 year old type money um, where those people have much more money to, to spend on, on things like durable goods which are our cars and houses and things like that you know if you look at what's marketed to tweens it's often really gimmicky gadgety fashionable kind of stuff that uh, that is relatively cheap so setting your price is very important if you make something too expensive for your targeted market then you won't sell it Okay, there might be resistance to change. So um, people and organizations can be resistant, reluctant to change, feeling comfort and security in the familiar, thus resisting new ideas and products. Um, you saw this a little bit with um, the laser disc. Now I don't know if you know what a laser disc is, but you know back when everybody had VCRs, um, there was um, a product that was out. It was called a laser disc, and a laser disc was basically like a giant. DVD player or DVD, so it was you know this it was uh, about the size of a, a vinyl record if you know how big that how big that is, and you would watch your movies on that thing and and they had good sound quality and everything, but they were just they just never caught on. People were resistant to using them. Um, they were expensive, um, and you know people said, well, I'll just stick with my my VHS. And then DVDs eventually took over that market and and pushed the the laser discs out completely. So. Um, there's also this aversion to risk. So risk aversion is the concept in um, economics and finance and psychology related to the behavior of consumers and investors under uncertainty. So you know, some people might not want to take the risk on a new invention, um, and therefore, you know, especially you know, companies may not want to take the risk on a new invention. So they may not they may not try to um, actually um, market it. All right, is there a need for the invention? So a good example of this has to do with alternative energy sources, so solar and wind and waves and things like that. Um, you know, those things actually, when, when oil prices are high, um, they, uh, those, those, um, those sectors of the market, the, the alternative energy sectors, actually do pretty well because, you know, with, with the cost of, of oil and gas being high, they um, people will start to look for alternatives to you know spending all that money, um, but when the cost cost of oil is low, they're like meh, don't need it. I'm gonna stick with with oil because it's tried and true technology. I don't need to change anything. So you know it depends on is there the need for the invention. Um, so it, it is interesting that when oil oil prices are high, alternative energy gets a boost. Um, when oil prices are low, it tends to have a, a, a real downward effect on the market. Okay, um, disruptive innovations are products or types of technology that challenges existing companies to ignore or embrace technical change. This is a, a really good video that shows you what an, uh, a disruptive innovation is, so please do watch that. Okay, sustaining innovation. So this is a um, basically when you have a new or improved product that meets the need of consumers and uh, sustains manufacturing. And an example is the iPhone. Sorry, that we, we talk about the iPhone a lot in this, uh, this section. And basically, you know, people bought the iPhone and then they started buying the next one and the next one and the next one. And this helped to sustain the development of, of better and better iPhones um, over the years. So this is called sustaining innovation. It's basically um, giving consumers something that's just slightly better than the one before and, and that will make it so that they buy it and therefore um, they are... Uh, um, continually to uh, sustaining our manufacturing needs. 
Okay, process innovation. This is when you improve the method of manufacturing and it often leads to reduced costs or benefits to consumers. And of course, the most famous example of this would be this, the assembly line, Henry Ford's big innovation. It was definitely a process innovation. People were making cars before this, but what they were doing is they were making a car from, you know, one person or, or a group of people would make a car from scratch. So they would build the entire car um, together. Uh, that made it expensive. So what Henry Ford did is he broke down the building of a car into um, discrete steps and then the car moved through uh, an assembly line. So people on the assembly line would do one job every day. So one person would do whatever this guy's doing. He's tightening some sort of bolt somewhere. He's bolting something on somewhere in the, uh, maybe it's the engine here. So he's bolting the engine onto the chassis. And that's what he would do all day, every day. And the cars would be the thing that moves, not him. And that made things very cheap. Like Henry Ford could produce a car that the average person back in the early 1900s could afford. Um, if you look at uh, the cost of car bef cars before Henry Ford, well, essentially they were only something that very rich people could afford. If you didn't have a lot of money, you were not going to be buying a, um, a car. So Ford's innovation made it so that um, the costs were reduced and that benefited his uh, consumers. Um, Toyota also does some lean manufacturing. We'll get to that more in um, the HL section. But it, lean manufacturing essentially means that you're producing what you need at the time and not more um, than you need. Okay, we're going to talk about some strategies for, for innovation. And so some of the strategies that we're going to discuss are architectural innovation, modular innovation, conf uh, configuration, configurational innovation, and radical innovation. So let's start with... Um, architectural innovation. So this is the definition of that, which is the, the technology of the components stays the same. So essentially they're the same um, components, but the configuration of the components is changed to produce a new design, putting existing components together in novel ways. And so Sony did this back in the 1980s with the Walkman. So in the 1970s, you could buy a cassette player like this, right? Um, so this was a cassette player that you could buy and it would play uh, cassette tapes. And you could also buy headphones and you could use these headphones with these things but what what uh, what Sony did is they they miniature well they, they shrunk down the components and made it so that it was much more portable carrying this thing around was just no you know something that you didn't do so um, you they made it portable and they just basically reconfigured things that already existed modular innovation is when the basic configuration stays the same but one or more key components has been changed making it uh, an existing product better. So some examples of this would be, say you, you put a, uh, a new petrol filter in a car so it made the, the car more efficient. YouTube or Facebook was an example of modular in innovations in the sense that they, you know, the basic configuration of them has stayed the same, but they've changed key components to make, make, it, make them better and better. Um, this is a, a type of phone that's very modular that you can add things and change things and, and it's kind of an interesting idea so um, I think it was actually not uh, very much a success but uh, you know the idea is here that you can change out certain components in it um, but more or less the basic configuration is the same you have radical innovation so this is a really high risk strategy that introduces a new idea system or product that is very different from the existing paradigm so you can take the bladeless fans so these things right here you know they are a complete departure from the way that fans have been manufactured uh, since, you know, I don't know, since electric fans came about. So this is a complete and radical innovation, uh, um, and it makes it so that, you know, as they're advertising here, that a baby can even be, you know, in front of it and touch it and not worry about getting hurt. Okay, configuratorial innovation is a change that's made to both the technology and the organization so that we're talking about both there so it can be a change to a technology and the organization itself okay diffusion is the process where a market will accept a new idea or product um, the rate it accepts the new idea or product can be increased by several factors and you can watch this video to see what will increase the rate of um, of uh, acceptance okay suppression 
So when something is suppressed, it's a pro process where uh, a new idea or adoption of a product by the market is actively slowed. So what we're trying to do is slow something down. This may be due to difficulties competing with the dominant design, ambiguity over patent ownership, competing companies actively petitioning against a new product uh, it perceives as threatening, or the natural resistance to unfamiliar concepts. So suppression can be trying to, trying to basically squash an invention so that it does not become an innovation. Here's some examples of some of that strategy stuff. Please do watch these two things. And that's it. Thanks, guys.